everything we have to fear is in war. Fear there is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor for our sons and daughters, ever mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom burn. Welcome to the intersection of faith and politics. This is Wall Builders Live. I'm Rick Green, and I appreciate you joining us today. David Barton and I are going to share a special series with you today. It's a two-part series, and we're picking up on part two today. It's out of Constitutional Live with David Barton and Rick Green. It's a DVD series that we did, teaching on the Constitution cover to cover. We go through the whole thing, every amendment, every article, and we talk about all those issues of today and how to look at them from a constitutional perspective and what the Founding Fathers intended. And in that program, we actually covered something that's a hot topic today, and that is the amendment process for the Constitution. A lot of states are considering a convention of states so that the states can amend the Constitution to restore the proper balance between the federal government and the state governments and put the feds back in to their proper jurisdiction. How would that work? What did the founders intend? All those questions, we cover them in Constitutional Live. So we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday, taking you to that segment in Constitutional Live, where we cover the amendment process. So we'll go to David Barton and myself, Rick Green, in Constitution Alive. The document these guys put together was, was pretty amazing, but it can be improved upon. We've done some pretty good improvements over the years, some bad ones too, but we've done some good ones. Any ideas? All right, this one's from Sabrina in Michigan, and she asks, so how do we work to fix this problem of recess appointments as we the people? How do we work to fix the problem of recess appointments as, as we the people? We have to, I hate to sound like a broken record, but we have to know how they work, what the document says, and then we've got to communicate with our members of Congress. We've got to communicate with the uh, candidates for Congress to find out where they stand on this issue and say, we want this fixed. We want language uh, agreed upon by the members of Congress where they'll, they'll tighten it up and they'll say, we're not going to approve. The Senate really is the one you've got to work on here. We've got to have senators that are willing to say, we're going to filibuster every appointment of a president that uses recess appointments inappropriately and unconstitutionally. And so the Senate has to be the one to stand up, which means we the people have to choose senators that are willing, and we have to push the Senate to do that. The only other option would be a constitutional amendment. So you could add that to our list of constitutional amendments here to say, uh, to, to, to clarify the language in the recess appointment there. And maybe you could just pick a time. I mean, I'm just brainstorming with you here. Maybe you actually define a recess and say that a recess has to be for more than 60 days or 90 days or whatever it might be. Yes, ma'am. We need a amendment that there should be a Constitution course taught to everybody that goes in Congress, <laughs> Senate and the House, and before they take their oaths. Every member of Congress has to go through the Constitution class before. And pass. And pass. they got to be able to pass. <laughs> we need a good test, all right? You guys can help me come up with a test when this is all said and done. I like that. That's really good. If we have a convention of the states in the future, I really hope the four of you are delegates. All right, one more. You had another one. To oh, no, ma'am, you go ahead. Um, I'm not quite sure about this, but um, what can be done and by who to demand a balanced budget? And we, how long has it been since we had one? Yeah. The, oh, I don't know the answer to how long it's been. That's a good question. Um, she asked what can be done uh, to, to demand a, a balanced budget. It's gotta be, we've got to pass the amendment. Remember what we said last night? One vote. We came within one vote of having a balanced budget amendment. That was 1999. Uh, I think the momentum is there right now. I really do. I think this, I think the Senate, uh, the votes will be there. I think the, the, the people want it. I think it makes sense. I forget the last polling numbers, like 75 or 80 percent. It doesn't matter if you're left or right on this one. I think all, both sides agree that we need to rein in this, these numbers. It's just untenable. So it's, it's, it's either, it, we either have to get enough members of Congress to just do it on their own, or we've got to pass a constitutional amendment. I think it's going to have to be an amendment. I don't think Congress is going to rein themselves in on this. I was thinking about impeachment if they didn't get it done. Somehow. I don't think, you know, I wouldn't, I would not agree with impeachment for um, the deficits just because I, the Constitution specifically says that they can borrow money on the credit of the United States. So I, I don't think it's an impeachable offense, but, um, but I'm all for throwing them out of office. You don't have to impeach them, but you can, you can throw them out of office at the ballot box. And if you defeat them at the ballot box and get somebody else in there that says, I'm willing to do what it takes to balance the budget. Yes, sir. 
Can executive orders be reversed by a new president? Yes, absolutely. The question was, can an executive order be reversed by a new president? Absolutely can. Uh, in fact, there's a great article if you want to Google or just go to Heritage Foundation's website uh, and Google executive orders. He wrote it in 2001, actually, and he went through a lot of President Clinton's executive orders and said the new president absolutely should have a commission review every single one of these executive orders and overturn them uh, just by uh, writing a new executive order that says we're no longer uh, going, to, going to implement that. So they could. Congress can do it, too. Uh, but, but a new president absolutely could review every one of those executive orders. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Joseph Story is one of the most important names in American jurisprudence. Not only was he placed on the U.S. Supreme Court by President James Madison, but he also founded Harvard Law School and authored numerous legal works on the Constitution. While today's revisionists claim that the goal of the First Amendment was absolute religious pluralism, Justice Joseph Story vehemently disagreed. He declared, The real object of the First Amendment was not to encourage, much less to advance, Mohammedanism or Judaism or infidelity by prostrating Christianity but was to exclude all rivalry among Christian denominations. According to founder Joseph Story, Christianity, not pluralism, was the goal of the Founding Fathers in the First Amendment, for only a Christian nation is tolerant and thus is truly pluralistic. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. As you mentioned earlier, we've got 80 some odd years of abuse in the judicial system. Yeah. And, and judges legislating, making decisions well outside their bounds, and it's become the norm, the accepted the thought process. It's, it's one of your myths. How do we turn that around? That, uh, and that and is that's a generational answer. That one will not happen overnight. Uh, and, and what he was saying was you've got. What was the year you put on? I think you're about right, 80 years? 80. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been a long time of a judicial mindset that, that is unconstitutional. And how do you turn it around? It will not happen overnight. And it takes, it takes both pieces I talked about earlier. It takes us, we the people, looking for senators that will only approve judges that are strict constructionists, um, voting for presidents that will, only vote, uh, that will only nominate judges that are strict constructionists. But it also takes a, 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 an education change and a cultural change. That's these law schools that are coming along and the philosophy in the law schools going back to original intent and, and not having this judicial high-handedness and this, this, this you know, high priest of the, of the law mentality. That's going to take a while because you got to think about you know, all the guys my age that went through law school 20, 25 years ago. Most all of them were taught that philosophy. I mean, it's going to take a while for that to change. Not that it'll ever you know, be all of one or the other. It's you know, it's just like anything else in a free society. It's going to be a matter of which side um, is, is, is winning those particular battles at that time. There's always going to be a difference of opinion. And, it's a, and the beauty of our system is if you can win the day on the arguments and you can convince enough other people to move the direction of the culture that way, then it'll go that way. And there, there are, you know, swings. And, and uh, unfortunately, for a long time, we've gone away from what these guys clearly said that they believed. I think, I, actually, I really believe that that tide is turning. I, I think there's some really great things happening in our country right now, and I don't think it's short term. I think we're not even, we're not even close to seeing the crest of the, the we the people getting back engaged in their government and saying we want to go back to what these guys gave us in terms of those basic principles of, of freedom, and we're willing we're willing to do the hard work. We're willing to do the homework. You guys traveled here from all over the country to study the Constitution. That blows my mind. If you told me two years ago that I was going to be spending virtually every Saturday somewhere in the country teaching the Constitution for eight hours all day on Saturday, that most weeknights I'm going to be doing an abbreviated three-hour class, not in the buckle of the Bible belt, in places like Chehalis, Washington, uh, in Newark, Delaware, I mean, all over the nation, I'd have said, you're nuts.
nuts. There is no way people are going to sit down and walk through the Constitution. I just didn't believe it would happen. Fortunately, there was a guy in Austin, Texas, that convinced me to do a class in Austin. He said, you, you just put it together, I'll get the people there. And he got about 50 people there. And I said, you know, this was kind of fun. And when it was, when it was done, I was posting on Facebook and saying, you know, hey, we were talking about this, the First Amendment, we were doing this on the judiciary, and this was fun. And all these people started posting on Facebook saying, hey, will you come here? Will you come here? Will you come to Michigan? Will you come to the... I said, well, I guess so, sure. Okay. And two years later, 5,000 people have been through the class. I mean, it, it's, it's remarkable. And, and we're just, a, I mean, we're little bitty. I mean, I'm, I'm a blip on the radar. There are hundreds of classes taking place all over the country studying the Constitution. It is exciting to me that it's happening. I think we're getting back on track. And when we come back, that's what we're going to close with tonight is doing our duty. How do we do our duty under the Constitution? Because remember when we started, you know, I, don't, I wanted you to leave here with a burden, a, a burden to say it's my responsibility to save this document, to save this country, to save what these men put in place. I hope that as we've gone through the Constitution that you haven't just thought how to hold the public servants accountable with this, I hope that as we've done this, you've constantly been saying, oh, that's my job. Oh, I, I see myself in there. I, that, that's, a, that's a responsibility for me. It's not all about them. It's about us. What are we supposed to do as citizens? How do we, how do we be good citizens? What do we do to uphold the constitutional principles? And that's what we're going to close out with tonight. So we'll take a quick break for right now. We'll be back with Constitutional Live. Our right to vote is protected throughout the Constitution, so don't waste it. Every chance you get to vote, let your voice be heard and values counted. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Today, there are numerous documented accounts of individual students being disciplined simply for bringing a Bible to school. Fisher Ames would have been appalled at this open hostility toward the Bible. Fisher Ames was the founding father who authored the House of Representatives language for the First Amendment. In his day, he vehemently objected to any attempt to minimize the Bible at schools. In fact, he declared, Why should not the Bible regain the place it once held as a school book? Its morals are pure. Its examples captivating and noble. The reverence for the sacred book that is thus early impressed lasts long, and probably, if not impressed in infancy, never takes firm hold of the mind. Founding Father Fisher Ames, the man most responsible for the wording of the First Amendment, believed that the most important school book was the Bible. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Okay, so we talked about a few possible amendments to the Constitution. Most of these that we discussed there at Independence Hall are really, again, back to this idea of restoring the original intent of the Constitution. It's not really changing the system. It's restoring what the founders intended. Mm -hmm. And one of those two ways to amend the Constitution, a convention of states. So this is an idea that the founders gave us. I mean, mm -hmm. they clearly thought this would be a good thing to do when it was necessary. And, and, and But some people have questions about how it would work if we had yeah. a convention of states. Well, even beyond that, some people don't even get to the question. Say, no, this yeah. is a terrible thing. And and so it's a pop, apocalyptic type of language. That, man, if we have this, they will take over the convention. Right. We've got all these guys out there who hate the Constitution, take it over, they'll abolish the Constitution. Wait a minute, the founders raised the bar so high yeah. that it's not only going to take 38 states to ratify abolishing the Constitution, you don't have to have 38 states. You can just have one body in one state. I mean, if you That's get split right. legislatures, you can have a conservative house and a liberal Senate, and the conservative house says, well, we ain't doing it. It doesn't take 38 states. It just takes 38 bodies out of the 99 bodies. Well, that if are you, yeah, that's right. So even I was thinking, even what I said in Philadelphia, 13 states kills a bad amendment. But like you're saying, actually, it's less than that. It's half of that's right. those 13 states. So that's just right. one legislative body out of each of those 13 states. You can kill. And I have to admit, I used to be on a little bit of the Me fear too. side. I was like, man, I'm kind of worried about letting a bunch of people get together and possibly change the cost. It's not just those people in that convention that are quote, changing and amending the Constitution. It's all of us. It's mm -hmm. got to come back to us and get our approval. Well, you know, one of the things that, that got my thinking, because I was in the same way, I'd listen to all the, the, the apocalyptic type of language, and yeah. I don't want to lose the Constitution. You know, I mean, number one, we've already lost it. We're not using that's it now. That's true. That's you know? exactly so right. <laughs> what, what if we lose it? And, and that's assuming that the worst. But, if we you know, keep going the way we're going, we're going to lose it. We're going to lose we, it. So we've got to do something. And, 
you know, it, these are all the mites, you know, and, and we are in Texas, and we might have a blizzard on the 4th of July, <laughs> right, and, and we, like we might have a meteor come through and hit us while we're sitting here, and we yeah. might have a lot. But the one thing that got me was it does not endanger the Constitution to use the Constitution. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I, I so appreciate the, the right to trial by jury in the Seventh Amendment that I've got a trial coming. I'm not going to use the trial no. by jury because I, I think it's too invaluable to uh, use that's it. That's a great you point, know, David. I support free speech, but I'm not going to use it because I might endanger the First Amendment. Free. It's so precious, I can't. And, and I'm a big defender of the Second Amendment, but I'm not going to use it. But How can it destroy the Constitution to, to use, use the, the Constitution? That's a great way to look at it. If they gave you yeah. that tool, if they said there's two ways you can amend it, you can do it through Congress, where we've done it so many times, or if the states get ticked off at the federal government and they want to say, guys, we're pushing back, yeah. if we're going to use this Tenth Amendment approach as applied by the Article 5 of the Constitution, it can't hurt the Constitution to uphold the Constitution by using the Constitution. That's right. And if I take an oath to uphold the Constitution, it also includes Article 5, which includes a convention of states. Yeah. I can't say, I'm taking an oath to uphold the Constitution, except Article 5. I, I like the part about amendments through Congress. I don't like the part about convention. I can't do it. Well, and, and I remember in an earlier section you were talking about the fact that not only do we have that, that horizontal separation of, of powers and those checks and balances, but that vertical one as well. Isn't this a way for the states to you actually push back against the encroachment from the feds? Isn't remember, this the proper way to do it? Remember the Federalist Papers talked about that every one of those bodies had constitutional arms of self-defense. Yeah. States, they had, the, they had senators appointed, first off. We lost that through the 17th Amendment. But they have the 10th Amendment to defend them. And they also have a convention of states, Art yeah. Article 5, to defend them. Those are all tools that were given them by the founding fathers so the states could push back against federal overreach. So those are all potential uses. And quite frankly, the debate will go on. It has gone on for a long time. It went on back then. That's why they included right. that. Right. It was not a novel idea that they just came up with out of thin air. It's because there were discussions already going on this topic back then. Yeah. And so it's just new in our generation. It's being resurrected in our generation. You know, some, some did this by calling for a balanced budget amendment back a couple of decades ago. And yeah. there's still some calls for that. And, and that, that's fine. Whatever it is, we're having to look at the Constitution afresh and anew. But my position is you do not endanger the Constitution by using the Constitution. Right. And, 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 you know, you said also before we went to Philadelphia this idea of, of, of because it's, it's drawn out and there's a lot of debate you and bet. there's a lot of logic and a lot of reason. I mean, that's a good thing. If you, if you think about it, this would cause it would be in the news. Everybody would be learning about mm -hmm. the Constitution. Each state is going to be debating this in their state legislatures. I can't see how that's bad. That's good for us to get more educated about the Constitution. And, and on, on the things. side that we might wipe out the government, and wait a minute, w this is going to take a process of years to get done. Yeah. And by the time we have debates in the legislatures of all 50 states, and by the time you have a House and Senate debate, and by the time you see if you can get 38 states to come together on this, this is going to be thoroughly vetted through the people. We will have had discussions extensively on this. And by the way, the notion of being able to wipe out the Constitution at such a convention, and it doesn't exist. Yeah, that's and, a totally false premise. I mean, remember the current polling is right now, nearly three-quarters of the nation respects the Constitution. They don't yeah. think it's being used right, but they respect it. So they're not going to be willing to wipe this thing out. Well, well and specifically to that, I've heard people say, well, what if they, if you had a convention of states and they do the same thing that they did in the first... Runaway you know, convention. Yeah, run, that's not possible because, again, it's still whatever they do has to come back, back to, the to the states. People. It's got to come back to us and you've got to have 38 that's states right. approved. They, so. and, and it's interesting, Article 5 actually limits that by saying amendments to this constitution that's right, that's right. it doesn't it doesn't say you come out with a new constitution it says yeah. amend what well, that's you know the the original constitutional convention they just met there to revise the articles of confederation they came out with a whole new document no because had that violated what the states sent them there for, the states would not have ratified it yeah. the states knew that they probably could not revise the articles of confederation you go try but you know what? Get us a document that gets us into a nation. Yeah. And, and that's what they did. And it's interesting that you have examples through that process, even back in the Continental Congress, that the states were explicit with their delegates. For example, when we signed the Declaration, originally when we were debating the Declaration, Pennsylvania told its delegates, you do not sign a, a separation of Great Britain. As the debates went on, they changed positions, so they sent word to their delegates, sign, separate from Great Britain. 
Well, half the delegates refused to sign individually. So the state legislature popped them all out of there, sent new ones back. That's how Benjamin Rush became a signer of the Declaration. He replaced one of the guys who refused to separate like the state legislature had told them to do. So the question of, well, what kind of delegates might Congress appoint? Congress doesn't appoint the delegates. The states, states appoint do. the delegates. That's right. And the states control the delegates. And if the delegates start doing something the state didn't send there to do, the Recall. state will just call them back yeah. home. Really? Easy. So the history is there. I mean, yeah. history answers all this. And, and so, uh, again, I mean, we need to have open debates on this because it is a big issue. But this is, I'm not scared of using the Constitution. Yeah, use the Constitution to save the Constitution. That's right. It's not going to destroy it by any That's stretch right. of the imagination. You know, we had an, a question back at Independence Hall about executive orders right. and a new administration coming in. What are your thoughts on that in terms of uh, if you come in as a, as a new president and the previous president has done a bunch of executive orders, do you not have the opportunity to reverse some of those? Well, it, you know, I, I love what you said because the, the proposal from Heritage about having a commission to review every yeah. presidential, that is a great idea. Yeah. And it's a thing that ought to be done. But let me, let me give you some examples historically. Okay, you take executive orders. All right, here's president signing an executive order. But let me just give you three presidents for a moment. Okay. And, and executive orders oftentimes are associated with activist presidents who are trying to get around Congress or trying to do things the Constitution doesn't allow, so they do it through executive orders. So executive orders, as you said, completely legitimate. George Washington had executive orders, but it's whether you're trying to circumvent the Constitution. Right, if you're implementing... A law that was passed by Congress, that's one that's thing, one and thing. that's fine. That's but right. But if you're creating law or reversing law without Congress's approval, that's where we had a real problem. Now, look at three high numbers here. Woodrow Wilson, 1800 thing. Now, Woodrow Wilson really decimated the Constitution. Major progressive. Yeah. Ignored the Constitution. In fact, we were talking earlier about the 16th and the 17th Amendment. Now, remember you showed me that poster, 1913. It was a really bad year. <laughs> the worst year ever. <laughs> yeah. And Woodrow Wilson was president. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> And so Woodrow Wilson's, pre look how high the, the numbers are there. Now, just out of curiosity, do you think the papers reported 1,803 executive orders? I doubt it. I doubt it, which is why you need a commission come in to look at all of them, because yeah. even the ones we hear about, you know, take any president you want, you may have heard of a dozen executive orders. No, there, there's going to be more than that. Right. Here's another president. Look at this, Calvin Coates, 1,203, and, and then look at Franklin Roosevelt, 3,522. Wow. Now, this is kind of mystifying because... I will tell you, quite frankly, I consider Calvin Coolidge to be one of the most sound presidents in American history. I consider him to be one of the greatest constitutional guys. He knew the Founding Fathers as well as anybody I've ever read on the Founding Fathers. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the United States Constitution but just felt like, man, the classes are boring or it's just that old language from 200 years ago or I don't know where to start? People want to know, but it gets frustrating because you don't know where to look for truth about the Constitution either. Well, we've got a special program for you available now called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. And it's actually a teaching done on the Constitution at Independence Hall in the very room where the Constitution was framed. We take you both to Philadelphia, the Cradle of Liberty and Independence Hall, and to the Wall Builders Library, where David Barton brings the history to life to teach the original intent of our founding fathers. We call it the Quick Start Guide to the Constitution because in just a few hours through these videos, you will learn the Citizen's Guide to America's Constitution. You'll learn what you need to do to help save our constitutional republic. It's fun, it's entertaining, and it's going to inspire you to do your part to preserve freedom for future generations. It's called Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. You can find out more information on our website now at wallbuilders.com. He quoted them, he cited them, and you go, wow, he issued 12 and You know what? Calvin Coolidge, most of his orders were trying to repeal Woodrow Wilson's well, orders. He's reversing. He's reversing. Pre okay. that's, so you've got that's progressive why so high. here that's, that's doing right. all this growth of government through that's executive right. orders. He comes in and actually does what just, that article is about. And yeah. just reverses them. So it can absolutely be done. That's something any president can do. But the idea of finding out exactly what did that last president sign yeah. and does that comport with the Constitution? Most folks don't even think of that when they come into office. They start getting busy with nominations. They start getting busy with hearings and foreign policy and cabinet appointments and executive orders, really big stuff. 
All right, so we've covered the amendment process. We talked about every area, every branch of government. We talked about every article, all the amendments. When we come back, we're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about us, what we as citizens need to do to save our Constitution in our very last section on Constitution Alive with David Barton and Ruth Green. Well, folks, that was Constitution Alive with David Barton and Rick Green. It's our program walking through the Constitution. Yesterday and today, we shared just a small segment out of that full program, and that particular segment was on the amendment process. If you just tuned in today and you missed yesterday, be sure and visit our website at wallbuilderslive.com. You can get yesterday's program and today's. Just click on that archive section. And by the way, you can share them with folks. We encourage you to do that. Take these programs Email them out to your friends and family, link to them on Facebook, get others to learn about our Constitution. This particular series that we did yesterday and today, again, just one segment out of the entire Constitutional Life program, but very important, this amendment process. We've got to get this down, folks. If we're going to save the Republic, we've got to put the federal government back into its proper jurisdiction. The only way we can do that is through amendments to the Constitution to correct what the court has deviated from in terms of original intent. They've created a court-created concoction of a Constitution, and that's what we're living under today instead of the actual Constitution. And we, the people, through our states, are going to have to amend the Constitution and get it back to its proper place. So be sure and check all of that out at wallbuilders.com. You can get the full Constitution Alive class there. Find out more about it there. Uh, But find out what's happening in your state. Visit conventionofstates.com. Find out what you can do to help restore our republic. Thanks for listening today to Wall Builders Live. We stand undivided.